Hi everyone, it's Ray here from Women's Football Today. Long time no see, ages since we did a video, but here we are. Here we are again, and I'm joined today by Rob Prattley, big Chelsea fan. How are you doing, Rob? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Ray. And it's very good to see you again. It's been a long, long time. It has indeed. And you know, I really would like to be sitting here today talking about the Chelsea game at the weekend. Uh, <laughs> You know, you know, you know me. I'm obviously a big city fan. Uh, city lost as well, so that's gone by the by. But there's a, st a story been brewing at City for a little while, and a couple of weeks ago, Rob put out a tweet, uh, well, a series of tweets, a nice long thread about what's going on at City uh, and Gareth Taylor, the manager. And I, um, I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a chat with Rob because it kind of, you know, sprung me into action. And the last message, uh, private message or DM I sent to Rob uh, back in November last year was, uh, I'd said, um, you got to, I think I said the season before, you, I'd said, you got to give Gareth Taylor time. Um, this right now, I'm saying he needs the boot. That's how strongly I felt about it. Now, the, obviously, there's going to be a, a big difference of opinion between City fans and, uh, and, and neutral fans as to whether... Gareth Taylor should stay or go. But, you know, another poor start to this season out of the Champions League already. Uh, was it qualified stage? Uh, um, you know, not even getting to the groups. Um, a, a defeat at the first game of the season, letting four goals in against Aston Villa. Um, it's not a great start. So what I'm going to do is begin by going through some of the history about Gareth Taylor and his time at Man City women's team. So, Gareth Taylor had a, a long career as a, a footballer, 16-year career, nine major clubs, lots of loan deals, and he played for City for two or three seasons. Now, in 2011, he joined City um, as a coach based out in Dubai, uh, developing talent there. And two years ago, in 2020, he was uh, appointed head coach at City, taking over from the legend that was Nick Cushing. Now, when he joined... Uh, I think we have players. I'm going to reel off uh, some, some some players and, and the level they were. We had Demi Stokes, um, England uh, player. We had uh, England captain Steph. We had George Stanway, Lauren Hem, Ellen White, Kira Walsh, Ellie Roebuck. I think Jill Scott was still there. Uh, we had Caroline Weir. Some of those names, you know, are, are the are the players that won the Euros uh, this summer, and you got. Uh, people like Caroline, we are one of the best players in, in in the world. That summer, City went out and bought Chloe Kelly, Lucy Bronze, who was I think had been voted the best player in the world the year before. Alex Greenwood, both of them were Champions League Champions League winners with Lyon. They went out and bought Sam Mewis, Rose Lavelle, and Abby Dal Kemper, three US uh, in, uh, women's national team players who'd won the World Cup. So we were bringing in top, top talent. And I haven't even talked about, I mentioned Chloe Kelly's name, but another top talent, uh, England international. So City were full of England uh, internationals and people like Caroline Weir. Um, and we brought in a whole host of uh, fabulous talent. Uh, the reasonable season, I, I think, overall, quite, quite decent um, under Gareth Taylor. City finished second in the uh, Women's Super League. Uh, lost in the semi-finals of the FA Cup, runners-up in the Community Shield, and knocked out in the quarter-finals of the League Cup. All two, Chelsea. Um, yeah. And uh, got to quarter, uh, I think, quarter-finals of the Champions League against a very good Barcelona side. Now, there was some criticism that season about the way uh, Gareth Taylor was using Rose Lavelle, or not using her. And uh, I had a, a good discussion with a, a friend of mine uh, about the mentality of City versus Chelsea, basically. You know, we had a chance to win the Women's Super League. We didn't take that in that season. You know, And getting beat by Chelsea every single time. We were winning in, going into the end of the game in the League Cup, quarter-final 2-1, and then we ended up uh, losing that game 4-2. So there were some uh, mumblings and rumblings. Um, last season, it started a very, very poor start to the season. You know, yes, there were a lot of injuries. Players have missing. You know, we'd lost people like... The, the tower of power, Sam Mewis, we'd lost a couple of other good players. Uh, but once again, there was rumours of unrest in the camp. We lost to Real Madrid in the Champions League qualifiers. We were slow out of the blocks. And uh, thanks to Man United, actually, 
I think, collapsing uh, towards the end of the season. City did manage to finish third. Uh, that uh, allowed City to get into the Champions League qualifiers. Obviously, we, we've already been knocked out. Uh, City did win the League Cup. Uh, by beating Chelsea, um, I think on the day, probably deservedly so. City yeah. were the better side, um, but doesn't mean they're better than Chelsea, but they were the better side. Gary Tiller has he did actually the season before I've, I've missed this that he won the FA Cup, which was because of COVID the previous season's FA Cup. So Nick Cushing would we had got us there, and, and Gary Taylor uh, took us over the line. We had a couple of uh, good transfers in, uh, we had K Khadija Shaw. And Vicky Losada. So I think most uh, people, whether City fans or not, would say that they were pretty decent signings. But it was, you, I think you can't argue it was a disappointing uh, season. Now, we've had a whole host of City players leave, which is fuel the fire that there's unrest or there has been unrest in the camp for a, a little while. Uh, we had Lucy Bronze leave, you know. I don't think Lucy personally hit the, the same heights uh, at City um, second time round as she did at Lyon when she was, I think she in one poll or, or one award, she was the best player in the world. Uh, she re, uh, you know achieved that accolade, um, and she said it was a time to leave. Okay, you think fair enough. Ellen White retired at the end of the the, the uh, Euros after winning that. Georgia Stanway left. That was a little bit well. It's surprising and it isn't because she was messed around a little bit. I think she spent a lot of time playing right back at times at City. Yeah. So it was a little bit odd, but she wasn't, it's like she wasn't trusted to play further forward as she is for England. And she's a cracking player for England. There's no doubt about that. Caroline Weir left, one of the best players in the world. She went off, uh, off to Spain. Um, and then I think this is the one that nobody could see coming from outside. Kira Walsh. Kira Walsh leaving, you know, Kira Walsh right now, top of her game, absolutely the top of her game. She's only 25 years old, um, arguably the, the best player in the Euros, um, you know, incredibly important for Man City, been at Man City since 2014, so that's eight years. So, you know, uh, and I think before that, she was a City fan as well. So it's really, really um it's disappointing and a shock to see someone of her quality leave because if you're a fan of a club, you're more likely to stick around for an extra few years. You know, you can mm. look at someone like Harry Kane in the men's game um, and sticking around and, you know, uh, players will stick around at their, um, the club they supported since they were a kid. Uh, maybe one or two seasons, they'll stick around one or two seasons more than if they had no affiliation with that club. So that's a lot of stuff about Gareth Taylor. Um, obviously, as I said, City have had a bad start to the season. I'm going to throw it open to you, you, uh, to you, Rob, to, to to let you have a go. What do you think has been going wrong at City? And, th and a second question: Why is nobody really openly talking about it? So again, I um, I've discussed this quite a few times in the last few days. So I'll try, for people, anyone who may have, you know, listened to multiple versions of it, I'll try not to repeat the same sort of spiel. But I think there's a couple of sort of things. Number one, I don't think it's fair to blame everything on Gareth Taylor. I think Gareth Taylor is not necessarily the cause of it, but I think he is the perpetuation of the problems. Um, I think, you know, there is a root cause that stems deeper, possibly to a level of complacency, maybe in the back room of the, um, of the club and in sort of the way it's being managed, perhaps the fact that, on the men's side, they're so utterly dominant. So as a result of that, there's almost, you know, that culture of complacency is the wrong word, but that culture that they don't need to change anything, just things will eventually just go back to working. Number two, there's a huge turnover. And whenever you have a huge turnover of key players, it inevitably gets people talking and that inevitably causes people to get unsettled and that causes more people to think about their future and, you know, causes a constant cycle of sort of unrest. Number three, I think there's a fear, certainly internally within the club, that there might be a repeat of last season, and that's causing unnecessary pressure. Obviously, the result against Aston Villa, I don't think, I don't think necessarily losing was so bad. I think it's the nature of how the loss occurred, you know, being so porous at the back. I, I think it's fair to say that four goals for Villa 
didn't flatter them. I think they didn't create enough chances to, you know, score multiple times. And is the fact that before the game, although Villa have, I think, recruited very well in the summer, they weren't one of the sides you immediately looked at and say, yes, they could put four past, you know, Manchester City. I appreciate some of them are goalkeeping mistakes, but at the end of the day, you've got to factor that in, you know, anyway. And you've got to acknowledge and say that that's part of the game. That that does happen. And, you know, perhaps you sort of say it was unlucky for a couple of them to be in the same game. You also obviously had the deflected goal. But at the same time, you make your own luck. And that's how, you know, Villa would sort of, I think, approach it again. City did have their own share of luck in how they got back into the game. And at 2-0, I think it's fair to say that if it had gone in at 2-0 at half-time, you may not have even seen that same response from City in the second half because 2-0 is a very different scoreline to 2-1, um, as we've seen many a time. But <clears throat> I do feel that there's just something there's something fundamentally sort of flawed at this moment in time at City, and I'm not really sure what it is. Again, I suppose it'd be the magic bullet of trying to work out exactly what it is. If I could, you know, tell them that and tell them how to fix it, I wouldn't be here, I'd be you know, advising them while I sit in a nice beachfront villa for the amount I've charged them for helping them on this. But in reality, I don't think there's an easy fix. I don't think there's a quick solution. In terms of why people aren't talking about it, I think this comes down to a couple of things. Number one, I think there is a, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, I think there's less of an appetite in the women's game to be hypercritical of managers. Um, in the men's game, with the money and everything that's sort of swilling around, Every manager in the Premier League is only two or three games, you know, losses away from a crisis. I, I sort of see, again, I'll use Chelsea as an example. I think sacking Thomas Tuchel was incredibly harsh. But you look at it and the nature of how the season started, it was OK, but it wasn't to the standard people maybe expected. And so that's why effectively, along with a multitude of other reasons, he ended up getting the axe. So I think to a point there is that and there's just not the media appetite to push for sackings. Number two, and I think this is maybe one that, you know, you might contest this, you might object to it, is that I think that City at times do get a softer ride, I think, from the media. Um, and I think Gareth Taylor especially gets a softer ride from the media than some of the other coaches because of the fact that City had, weren't competing in a title last year. People don't didn't expect them to be in a title race all year. So the focus was sort of almost off City. They were sort of they were just sort of there. No one expected them to go down. I mean, I don't think anyone expected them to get relegated. Only at the very end of the season did people expect them to be in the Champions League race because of how poor the start was. And they were just sort of drifting. You know, it was just sort of a case of that, you know, it always became a bit of a lottery. And I sort of joked about it with one of the other City fans. It became a bit of, you know, everyone's favourite second team for a little while. Oh, will City finally get their act together this week? Um, and it was, you know, quite... Again, I take it to the game where Chelsea went to Etihad Campus last year and won sort of 4-0 and won so comfortably. I don't think I ever, you know, in my wildest dreams at the start of the season would have looked at that fixture and said, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to the EDS and winning 4-0. Um, and, you know, we're going to sort of win it as comfortably as we sort of did. I mean, it could have been more. I think it was, you know, it ended up being 4 more due to the fact that Chelsea themselves were saving and conserving energy rather than going absolutely for the throat. So I do think there's that aspect to a point of that. I do think, you know, the media have ignored it to an extent because it's not really been sort of relevant. And the final one, I almost feel this, yeah, again, this partly comes maybe due to a complacency or a lack of, you know, reaching out, a lack of exploring alternatives, is City don't really know what they want to do if they do set Gareth Taylor. Um, I've heard various suggestions of, you know, Jane Ludlow maybe in as an interim and potentially, you know, bring an ex-player back in to try and calm the dressing room down. I can see the merits and cons on both sides there. Um, there are other top sort of managers that are available, but there's no obvious sort of name you look at and you think, yes, they would come sort of straight back in. I think it's fair to say Nick Cushing, I doubt, is going to return. Um, and I think, you know, that is... Sort of, you know, just the nature of how his career has sort of moved on. He's moved on. I think he's still managing New York City FC. I still think they're doing quite well. It wouldn't surprise me if eventually he moves on to another team in the City Development Group. As I, you know, I know they highly regard him as a manager. So it's it sort of I feel that because there's that lack of the succession plan, there's almost a feeling that they want to stick with the current status quo because they're afraid changing it will affect it even more. But the thing, the thing is, Rob, you've got. You know, everybody knows the, the Manchester City men's team is incredible, uh, incredibly professional. They don't leave any stone unturned um, and they want to win. 
They, they really do. Um, they want to win every single game. They want to win every single trophy. And I'm sure that applies to the, the women's team as well. Uh, the, the issue is um, they're just so far away from it. And, um, you know, that, that first season under Taylor, you know, some people, um, some harsh critics might say, well, he benefited from the hangover from Nick Cushing and what Nick Cushing had done. That helped Taylor in his first season. Now we know what Taylor's really like. Um, yes, his problems with injuries. And yes, there's a problem with a turnover in players. Um, but surely, you know, City's hierarchy have got to be worried, you know, at the Champions League, uh, at the first shot again. Another, probably, a well, it is a poor start. It's only the first game, but it's, it's the manner of the way you, you've conceded four goals. You could have conceded possibly more. Um, and, and yes, you've got to integrate the new players but and, and, and change the style a little bit. But that's got to be a, a huge concern. Uh, and you know, I don't think City are a club that will uh, fire uh, people willy-nilly, especially someone they chose. I mean, if you go back to the men's side, Mark Hughes, when when, when Chapman Seward took over, Mark Hughes uh, was in situ. Um, problems with him, he was gone very quickly. Um, City, I don't think, want to fire somebody that they've brought in because that kind of admits that you failed, you got it wrong, and people don't like to admit they got it wrong. But what what do City, you know, how is City's hierarchy going to look at this? I don't really know, in all honesty. It's difficult because, again, this comes back to the wider sort of point of that I almost feel City's hierarchy have maybe taken their eye a little bit off the women's team. I think there needs to be more investment. Um, I don't think it's unfair to say that at this moment in time, I don't think City are making the most of what they have as a capital asset for marketing. Um, I think the fact that they've got two prominent Lioness winners in there, including the player that scored the goal, that you know won uh, England the Euros. I haven't seen enough of that inside the marketing. I haven't seen them pushing that side enough. Um, I also feel that there's probably, again, there's just almost a bit of it, and this may just be due to the fact that the men's side are you know so utterly utterly dominant. Is that level of complacency sort of creeping in? Whereas I think <clears throat> in Chelsea it's obviously a different case because I think they've got the you know the takeover that's just sort of happened. So there's you know all eyes on everything. There's determination by the owner to be quite active and sort of be quite open. They've also Emma Hayes, who um, is quite demanding as a manager. She knows what she wants, who she wants, when she wants to bring them in. So I think there's that aspect has to be also considered. But I do certainly, I do feel to an extent that City maybe at times have the wrong have the wrong approach to it. They almost like they're accepting that they're not going to sort of win the title. They're accepting at this moment in time, they're not going to compete. And so it kind of leaves them in a bit of a sort of limbo almost um, of that. They feel they're not on the level of, you know, a Chelsea or maybe even Arsenal, but they're above the level of everyone else. And that's a very strange situation to sit yourself in as a player because you're almost competing, but not competing. Yeah. And the very, very top players aren't going to want to sit in that bracket because they're going to want to be winning, you know, the WSL. They're going to want to be winning the Women's FA Cup. They're going to want to be challenging and winning the Champions League. The Conti Cup, I think that's sort of by the by. You know, I don't really think anyone... I think there's very few players in the top, certainly in the top four clubs that thinks, you know, I really want to win a Conti Cup. If you're further down the chain, then maybe, and, you know, I'm not trying to belittle the Conti Cup for that reason. I think every bit of silverware in the women's game is precious and should be celebrated because there's so few of them. But... I think ultimately the Conti Cup, if we talk about priorities, that probably comes fourth on the list of the priorities behind the FA Cup, then the WSL, and then if you're competing for it, the UWCL. Um, so I do feel that there's maybe just a bit of a malaise just overall at City, and it kind of feels that there needs to be quite a dramatic change to maybe alter this, and whether that is a change in the management, a change in the managerial structure, a change in the operational structure maybe a combination of both of them or, you know, I don't really know what the answer is in all honesty, yeah. but it's one of those things that it's increasingly becoming, I think, a bigger elephant in the room. And, you know, the little elephant has now suddenly become a very big thing that's overshadowing everything else. And that's going to cause a problem further down the line, especially if City do start poorly again this season and do, you know, continue in a poor sort of state, of, in a poor state of performance because 
it's ultimately going to, you know, make the questions even harder and sort of ramp up the pressure. And some managers thrive under pressure, others don't. Yeah, I mean, my my feeling is um, that um, the city owners they they don't want to leave any stone on on on, on turn, basically in their uh, pursuit of tr basically dominance. And I don't I don't believe that they'd let that they take their eye off the ball. I don't believe that they do that. You you know you look at the, the transfers. I'll repeat some of the names that we had in the last two summers. I'm not looking at this summer just gone. That people that have come in: Chloe Kelly, Lucy Bronze, Alex Greenwood, Sam Lewis, Rose Lavelle, Abby Dalkemper, Khadija Shaw, Vicky Losada. I mean, it, it shows. I th I think the um, and the, and also the players we already had. All those top players, you know, Lauren Hemp, and uh, just to name three at the time we had: Georgia, Lauren Hemp, Caroline Weir, and Kira Walsh. Name four. Um, you know, you took all them together. It's, I think the desire is there, um, and I don't think they've taken up the eye off the, the ball, really. They, there's something else I thought. I'm going to move on to ask you, player unrest. Mm -hmm. There's been tons of rumours about players not being happy with Gareth Taylor, confrontations uh, rumoured as well. What's your thought on that? Do, do you think there's uh, the fact that uh, I think what, what kind of showed to me when uh, Kira Walsh left that there's so much going on there that, Obviously, we don't know about. It. So, what um, do you think? There's a been there's an underlying issue with player unrest against Gareth Taylor. Uh, it's difficult, right? Firstly, I want to just say here, this is not designed to be a witch hunt against the manager. Like, I wouldn't yeah. want to go on a stream and you know just witch hunt them. But uh, I will say it's quite telling that every single one of the players that's left City this summer, in their first interviews with new clubs, has talked about one of three things. Number one, identity as a club. Yeah. Number two, um, being, you know, valued and respected as a player. Or number three, dressing room harmony. Now, I think it was also quite telling that Caroline Weir, who, again, made it very, very clear she was happy at Manchester City, she really respected the fans, she really enjoyed her time at Manchester City, immediately went and celebrated in front of Manchester City in the UWCL. Now... Do I think, I, I personally am of the belief that I don't mind players celebrating against their former clubs. You've moved on, you've got a new employer. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I know a lot of people get very het up about it. and I'm, I've never really understood it. But it was quite telling, I think, that she was so happy to celebrate. And, you know, I think that was her first professional goal for Real Madrid. So I can kind of understand it. There was other side effects there. But, you know, maybe you can sort of say to a point, she did it as sort of to prove a point of message. Georgia Stanway in her first interview for Bayern Munich, I think it was quite telling that she talked about being valued and respected as a player. And she sort of said, in the Euros, I felt really valued. Whereas last year at City, I didn't. I felt I was sort of treated as that utility player and sort of shunted around. And it seems baffling to me that you're looking at one of the players who is an unbelievable attacking midfielder or sort of attacking player. Yes, she can play elsewhere. But I feel, and I don't, you know, this is not a slight on her. I think anywhere on the pitch she puts down my, she would give 100%, whether she was a natural in that position or didn't have an absolute clue how to play with it. I mean, last year she had goalkeeping, a goalkeeping jersey made up for her. I'm sure she was the first bit of volunteer to say, you know, if needs be, I'll do it. So I have no doubt that it's, you know, not an issue with her there. But at the same time, I feel that if you've got a player on that calibre and that standard, you're working your best to try and accommodate them in their, you know, ideal position and their absolute best position. And I think that's what you saw in the Euros. She was sort of accommodated on that wide sort of right-hand side where she could cut inside and cause problems inside but also you know sort of do damage um outside of you know in that sort of central area and obviously scored that wonderful goal against Spain from that area and I don't think any point last year it almost became a sort of running joke of where is Stanway sort of going to play this week because she's not playing in her actual position and then the final one obviously is Walsh Walsh to me is the one that like is the real catalyst because you said lifelong City fan is you know Again, will continue to be a lifelong city fan. You know, we shouldn't say was a lifelong city fan. Is a lifelong city fan. It's not going to change. Yeah. Um, is probably, I think, the top three players in the world at this moment in time. Um, I would go as far as to say that she was my personal choice for player of the tournament, the Euros. Not to slight Beth Mead at all. I think Mead had an unbelievable tournament, but I just think defence midfielders they tend to get overlooked for everything. But the way I always say it to people about defensive mids is that you don't notice them when they're there, but you do notice them when they're missing and you do notice them when they're absent. Um, so I think that sort of was a big, a big, big one. And the big shock to me was that 
City knew for quite some time Walsh wanted to go. And yet they wait until the very, very end of the window to let it happen. And by that point, their preferred replacements were either unavailable or had gone elsewhere. Um, at least, you know, two of them I know went elsewhere. One of them they tried to get on deadline day again, but, you know, Juventus wanted, they wanted Julia Grosso, I think, you know, as well, reported on deadline day, but Juventus shifted the goalposts and they wouldn't pay up. Hasegawa, I think, is a good signing, but I don't think she's a Kira Walsh replacement. If anything, she's more of a Stanway sort of replacement. Um, and yeah, it just felt all very disjointed. And whether there is unrest or not still at this moment in time is debatable. I, I personally think there probably still is, because I don't think you can have that level of turnover without there being some. But I think it's also the nature of who you lose. You expect to maybe lose one or two players in the summer, but to lose, I think, what was it? Five, five or six? Top, five yeah. top players. Five top players in the summer, including you know five top internationals that have just won the Euros, and one very or four top internationals that have won the Euros, and one very good player who you know is one of the outstanding players for her country. I think you've got to ask questions. Absolutely, and I mean, Kira Walsh going to was it Barcelona? You, you say fair, fair enough. Barcelona are a good side. George is we going to Bayern Munich? I, <laughs> You know, this is no disrespect to Bayern Munich, but I wouldn't have put them on the same level as, as City right now. You know, of, of why City, I think, really want to develop to to become. You, I just don't mm. think. You know, maybe I'm just being my, my, my Man City bias, but it's, it feels like a downward step. Um, Caroline, we are going to Real Madrid. Does that seem like a a upward step? Oh, okay, Real Madrid knocked us out the Champions League, so the last two seasons on the bounce, so maybe it is. But you, ju you just think if City want to go somewhere, they shouldn't be losing their best play some of their best players to clubs like that. Mm. Yeah, no, precisely that. And I feel like it's a... You know, Barcelona, okay, fair enough. I can probably understand that. If a player went to Lyon, you know, at the end of the day, it's Lyon. You're not really going to challenge with them. I think if another English side tries at the moment to compete with Chelsea for a player and the player picks Chelsea over them, you kind of accept that because Chelsea have had that dominance yeah. and that, you know, certainly domestic monopoly. And they've also, you know, got Emma Hayes as a manager who I think, you know, is that incredible sort of traction and that pull. So I think you can understand those three sides. But it's then when you're losing out, I think, to other sides for players is then when you have to ask questions. Oh, again, Bayern are an unbelievable side. They are, you know, one of the things I will say with Bayern, they do have that real UCL, sort of UWCL yeah. pedigree. They are consistently around the sort of back end of the tournament. Last year was a poor year for them domestically, but they have, you know, had domestic dominance and competed with Wolfsburg in recent years. So I can understand them. Oh, actually, I'll throw Wolfsburg into that list as well. I think if mm. a player goes to, decides to go to Wolfsburg, I can understand that because they've been so dominant and they invest so much into the women's side. But I do feel that, you know, City then should be at somewhere near the top of the rest. There is money at the club. There are facilities at the club. There is very good players at the club. There is a young squad core that is developing. And, you know, people like Lauren Hemp, Chloe Kelly, Ellie Roebuck, um, Esme Morgan, Ruby Mace, they've all got at least, you know, 10 plus years in them still. You're talking about, you know, these are not players that are coming in and, and you know, are on the downturn. They are players that are developing, growing, getting better and better every single season. And you'd have thought players would want to come into that environment and be with it. But obviously, if they're hearing from club teammates or national teammates or whatever, or even just through the grapevine, that it's not a very good atmosphere, then that puts you off, you know, that sort of move and puts you off doing that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here's a question. I mean, I'll, I'll go through four of the players that left. And I'm just interested in your thoughts um, mm -hmm. to see whether you'd have taken them at Chelsea. Yeah. George Stanway. Yes. <laughs> Caroline Weir. Yes. <laughs> Lucy Bronze. Yes. Well, Bronze, Bronze actually, yes, as a player, but I will say I do feel that Bronze doesn't necessarily, I think she's on the downturn now. Yeah. And I do feel that the Euros, I think going to Barcelona suits her best because it's a, again, it's a bit like Trent Alexander Arnold. It's a defensive side where you don't really need to defend. Yeah, And I think that's what, you know, suits Brom's best nowadays. And that's no slight on her. That's just due to the fact that I think she's getting older and I think she'd rather play a midfield role and play a more. I think she'd rather... I think in all honesty, if you ask Lucy Brom's the position she'd most like to play in now, it'd be central midfield. Yeah. And that's just okay. due to the nature of the player. So I would take Brom's as a player, but I don't necessarily think I would take her at the moment in the current squad. 
if that makes sense. Yeah. And 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 obviously a very easy one, Kira Walsh. Yeah, oh yeah, you don't need to ask. You know, I <laughs> again I was on a I was on a stream back at the start of the summer and someone asked me about Chelsea's business for the summer and I said the one thing I would really, really like us to go and see is to go out and get Kira Walsh. And I said, you know, she's available, I know she wants to go. City will accept a bid if a club make an offer and they did accept a bid from Chelsea. And then it's a matter of just persuading the player. And ultimately, if you can't do that, that's a different, you know, if they decide elsewhere, that's different. But I wanted to at least try and see us go for it because I think, you know, a Walsh Cuthbert Fleming midfield is, you know, something incredibly terrifying. Or a Walsh Cuthbert Harder midfield is something that, you know, is absolutely terrifying to play against and, you know, would be incredible to watch. It, it would have been bad for City. It would have been bad because it's hard enough trying to catch, bridge that gap to Chelsea without give, giving you uh, our best players. Um, Precisely. And- I mean, you know, I, I, at the same time, I was on a similar, you know, thread of thought and I said to people, I'd really love to see Chelsea go out and try and get on a badge from United. Yeah. Obviously, this is me being, you know, purely from a Chelsea point of view of looking how we could win the UWCL. However, from a league point of view, I don't want to just see Chelsea monopolising, you know, buying players, I think, from, again, we got some six fit cover from West Ham. You obviously brought in Hasegawa from West Ham. Yeah. Arsenal brought in sort of Hurtig. Uh, United brought in um, Leon and sort of Marlis. Bringing in the better players from the other sides, I think, is inevitably going to happen. That's part of the food chain. Yeah. But what I think we need to see the minimal of is you don't want to see players moving from City to, say, Chelsea or City to Arsenal or Arsenal to Chelsea or whatever to try and do it because it's just going to lead to a point where the league loses the sense of the competitive semblance it's developing. And I think that's bad because ultimately we want the... There is going to be the most rich league in, you know, in a couple of years' time and the money is already starting to, you know, trickle yeah. in. You're seeing teams make signings that beforehand they wouldn't have had the facilities to do so. Um, and I think that ultimately can only continue and you can only have that level of interest if you've got a proper title race and you've got a proper relegation battle rather than, say, a team being relegated by Christmas and, you know, someone running away with it. It's a matter of when, not if. Yeah, yeah. it's like Liverpool a couple of seasons ago, you know, they were horrible. Anyway, I don't want to mention Liverpool in front of a Chelsea fan right now uh, after the weekend. Um, so I know this... this 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 chat and this uh, stream is is not really about you know getting rid of Gareth Taylor, um, yeah. you know. But but I've got to ask this question: How long has he got? How long has he got to show that he's still the right man for the job? I mean, I've been on another stream this week, and I, I I've nailed my card to the mark, so I'll stick to it. I think he'll be on by the end of October. I think that you've got some tough fixtures coming up. Um, I'll be honest; I don't expect you to get anything from Kings Meadow this weekend. Yeah. I think, especially if you defend like you did at the weekend, and also the fact that you're coming into a Chelsea side that, you know, hell hath no fury like Emma Hayes scorned. Um, <laughs> she doesn't like losing a game. And, you know, usually after, it's one of those things after we lost that Conti Cup game, for example, last year, we then went ahead and, you know, trounced, I think, Leicester 7-0 in the Cup game the week later. And you could tell at 7, even at 7, Emma wasn't satisfied. She wanted to go for the throat. She wanted to hurt them. Um, she doesn't like losing. She, you know, often the next side, fares the backlash and I think the way that City are defending at the moment the nature of how they set up um, sort of it will play more into Chelsea's hands to say Liverpool who were happy to sit in and be compact I don't think City have the facilities and the ability to be able to do that as a side um, just because there's not the right sort of players and structure in there I will say uh, that some of the use of players does really confuse me people like Angular for example who I think has been played out of position for a whole year now um I mean, she's at her best in a sort of creative, sort of almost in a number 10 role and being allowed to get forward and support the attack. But yet she's been relegated to this sort of, you know, sitting role in front of the back four and she often comes out of that role and, you know, breaks out of it and then that leaves you space in behind. And normally you'd have a Kira Walsh to sit in there and solve that. Unfortunately, there's now no Kira Walsh or Caroline Weir to sit in and, you know, block those passing lanes. And when they're not there, that causes problems. Um but yeah, I, th- I think maybe the end of October. I think, you know, I don't think City can really... I think a bad start this year will be more problematic than last year because I think United have strengthened. Obviously, yeah. it went to the final day last year and that was more due to the fact that United collapsed. I think they've got more firepower over there to get, bring them over the line. So I do feel, you know, it needs to be sooner rather than later. And I think if they do do that, they still will finish third. I've said this to someone else. Yeah. I think there's still a good squad there. I just feel the manager's not getting the most out of the squad. 
Yeah, I mean, just briefly, that those four games in uh, before the end of October, obviously Chelsea away, Leicester at home, Spurs away, and Liverpool at home. Um, we've got to remember it as well. It's all, it's a small league. It's not, yeah. you know, a ton of games. It, it's it's you know it's uh, when there's uh, twelve teams, it's twenty two games. Um, so there's not. Um, uh, you know, a, a ton of games. You know, you get to let's say the end of October, uh, you you have played a quarter, almost a quarter of the season in the, yeah. in the league. And you know, if City do, for argument's sake, lose the two away games, they'll be mid table, and it's going to be very difficult to um, to get back to, to challenge for the league. Um, and if you've lost three out of your first five games, I think that's extremely unlikely that you're going to mount a, a challenge unless you pretty much win the rest. Of your games and I don't see that happening. How long, for me? How long has Taylor got? Well, last November I said he should be out. Um, so, do I give him more time? You know, I'm I'm worried. Like you know, if we get to the end of October, that's as I said, that's five games gone, almost a quarter of the season. Um, would I give him any more? I, at some point, you're going to have to say if he's not, if he's not doing it, if he's not challenging, you know, you you can't keep going. Um, I'd, I'd be tempted to give him a, a little longer. You got it. I think maybe I'm not changing my tune, tune here, but uh, my tune. But I think give him a little longer because of all the upheavals. He's lost some of his best players. Um, he's got new players in. Maybe deserves a little bit more time. But but that's it. If you know, if there's yeah. somebody out there available, um, and 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 City are struggling by the end of October, you know, mi middle of November, I, I've. Uh, I, I think the writing would be on the wall. Uh, he's he's going to have to do really well, I think, to bring it back from here. Although it's only two games in the season, but you're at the Champions League. There's no coming back there. At least mm. the league is one game in. You know, um, he's still got the time to to recover that. It's been good to chat with you, Rob. It's uh, something I've missed, um, and hopefully, we can do it again. Especially if City beat Chelsea this weekend. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it'd be really we interesting this weekend because it genuinely will be a really interesting game because I think both sides can't afford to lose it. Yeah. And I think as a result of that, I think they'll both go out hammer and tongs to win it. So I wouldn't like to predict a scoreline. Um, I think it'll be either, it'll either go the exact opposite to what I'm thinking. It'll be a, you know, just a boring drab 1-0 one, one way with no redeemable qualities other than maybe a goal at a set piece. Or alternatively, it'll just be some ridiculous sort of firecracker game again, like a 6-3 or a 6-4 or something, you know, utterly bonkers and stupid, where from a defensive point of view, you're ripping your hair out. But hopefully it'll be good entertainment for people. Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I really do. Um, as I said, it's been great chatting with you, Rob, and hopefully um, as the season progresses, uh, we'll have you back on uh, a few times and uh, uh, keep updated with what's going on at Man City, Chelsea and uh, in um, the WSL. Uh, in the wider WSL. Thanks very much, mate. Yeah, pleasure.